to new places. Um, Sorry about that, Douglas. No worries. Um, so yeah, this is just a little outside view of the gallery. If you were to walk up the steps there and look in, this is what you would walk in and where I'm sitting. If I look to my left, this is what I see currently. So it's not a huge space. It's about 1200 square feet, um, a one man operation and um, not a trust fund gallery. So just um, doing what I can to keep the lights on with the support of uh, collectors and, and patrons. Um, the exhibitions rotate on about every six to eight weeks. Uh, this was an exhibition back in the early part of the year by a German photographer, Judith Steneken, and her project, A Mountain is Only a Slow Wave. In this case, uh, there wasn't a lot of experimentation in the printmaking, but we decided to kind of play with the installation. Uh, as you might be able to tell, that the some of the, especially the smaller frames here, the pieces are presented almost like a canvas. They're floated inside a thin wood frame. And the, uh, we used long nails of varying depths so that the pieces would have different depths off the wall, uh, some even overlapping uh, other pieces in front of them, and to kind of try and create a sort of almost what looked like music on a music notes on a, on a scale um, and have a bit of rhythm to the installation. So we always try to either play with the printmaking experimentation, experimentation and installation of the show um or or even just conceptual installation um these are some views of the current show which is a group show of 17 artists that myself and another curator put together called the intimacy of distance um in the back room which is now painted black we've got that dimly lit with some some nighttime pieces um this was a show that wanted to discuss questions of thinking about how far the subject could be from the, let's say the photographer before we call it a, um, what, where's the threshold between a portrait and a landscape? How far is the subject from the camera before we wouldn't call it a portrait anymore and we would maybe call it an environmental portrait? And then at what distance would we call it a landscape? So the show starts with this really beautiful piece uh, by British artist, Richard Leroy, where the subject is right up close and personal, almost, life-size and, and certainly life-size in the detail of the image. And as you move through the exhibition and come around to, to my left here, uh, the which ends with a landscape by Jeffrey Conley. Notice I call it a landscape uh, with a tiny little human figure that's visible up on the ridge of the mountain. So that as you move through the exhibition, the, the figure recedes uh, further and further from the viewer. And the question being, you know, at what point do you still call it a portrait? In the first several images, you would almost certainly refer to them as a portrait. This is the back room where things get a little weirder, a little more abstract. These are works by Alex Turner. Um, on the left, uh, Eileen Cowan in the middle and Mark McKnight on the right here, we see a very, what I would call process-based piece, which is a large cyanotype on cotton fabric. Uh, these are prints by Judith Steneken and Sama Al Shaibi, who are German and Iraqi artists, respectively. It's the, the Mark McKnight piece. This is a tiny little John Devola, a famous California photographer. This was a rare piece that we found in his studio, which is actually a silver gelatin on canvas, which is a pretty interesting little object. And uh, come on, Wi Fi. Uh, this is by Liz Miller Kovach, who's uh, an American artist from Los Angeles originally, but now based in Germany, where she is um, kind of performative work, where she is um, donning these um, very vivid, different color body suit sort of sheaths and um, placing herself in the shape of uh, effigies or Venus or uh, an odalisk in front of these um, toxic excavation sites around the world, both in the US and, and across Europe and Asia, uh, dressing herself in these colors uh, that contrast with, in this case, the um, evaporation pits at National Chloride in the Mojave Desert, these are chloride evaporation canals that result in these really hyper um, sort of prismatic uh, channels of water.
So yeah, sometimes it's, again, sometimes it's straight photography. Sometimes it's really object-based. Sometimes it's somewhere in between. This is a beautiful little print by Donovan Smallwood, who's a really young uh, photographer in New York who made a beautiful body of work called Lengwer in 2020 during the lockdown in Central Park of uh, young um, African-American friends and, and people walking in the park, um, lounging in the grass, sitting next to the, the ponds, enjoying Central Park, uh, but very poetic, really beautifully captured on medium format. Uh, he won the 2021 Aperture Portfolio Prize for that body of work. These are just kind of visitors in the gallery so you get a little better view of the space and a few of the works that you just saw from a different angle. Uh, on the far left is a print by Austin-based photographer Brian Schutmott, who's a really uh, one of the great, I think, uh, current working American editorial documentary photographers uh, and will be the focus of my next exhibition opening in December. So uh, the, the other thing I wanted to uh, quickly run through with you guys, uh, um, I wanted to give you a quick uh, overview. This is sort of an expedited version of a longer lecture. I know we don't have as much time as, as I normally do for this kind of uh, uh, talk on best practices for gallery relationships. Um, the most common question I get is obviously from artists and photographers. And Carol, do kind of holler at me if, if I need to take a break or you have any questions on behalf of anyone, uh, certainly open for Q&A here in a minute. Um, the question I get the most is, you know, how does an artist get their work into a gallery like this? I get it once or twice a week, probably someone coming in. Um, and, and I started giving this talk because I started to find that most artists and, and photographers uh, were really um, unaware of, of how that process works, of, mm -hmm. of how the relationships between galleries and artists work, how, who, if you sell things, who's paying for it, who pays for the framing, do I rent the space, you know, all these questions. And so I started um, giving this uh, talk, which I also do specific to an artist's work in private consultations, uh, which I can elaborate on later. Um, but, you know, the, the, there's not an easy question to the how, how do I get, uh, I'm sorry, an easy answer to the question, how, how do I get work into a gallery like this? Um, it's usually a slow process. Um, one thing to understand is there's a lot of different types of space, you know, in this case being a commercial gallery that relies on mostly print sales to keep the business going. There are nonprofit uh, exhibition spaces, there are regional museums, there are major museums. So there's a lot of different spaces and each one has a different way that that exhibition happens usually with nonprofit and regional museums it's simply an application process or getting to know the curator of that space and proposing a show um, for a commercial gallery it's usually heavily based on the relationship and the specific interest and style of that gallery for instance if you if you looked at my artist roster and you made um, abstract nudes you might gather that maybe this isn't the right gallery uh, for my work or, and, and a lot of times I'll get emails from an artist saying, Hey, I, I'd love to show my work in your gallery. Take a look, here's a PDF. And you can tell they didn't even look at my, they didn't read anything about the gallery. They didn't look at the artist roster. So the first thing is just doing basic research, finding galleries that show work that is, you know, seems like, yeah, I could see, I could see my thumbnail and my name sitting in there. Even if it's like big established artists, it's not so much about that as it is about the aesthetic uh, of the gallery and, and being honest, you know, do it, could I really see my work sitting in here among these other artists? And if you believe that and you've done your research and you think the gallery is, is someone that, um, that that might be able to, to, you know, be interested in your work, then it is, I think, still the most um, simple way of, of starting a conversation through email keeping it very brief, you know, hey, I did my research on your gallery. I really love artists X, Y, and Z. Um, I do this type of work. Here's a link to my website or here's a PDF. I still think a link is best because um, sometimes we're weary to open an unknown PDF or, or, or something like that. But uh, either of those is typically fine. Um, I, I discourage sending anything physical without permission. Don't send a book. Don't send um, prints. Don't, and most of all, don't just walk in in the middle of the day 
I think a lot of people have the conception that we just sit here and drink espresso and read, look at art books until somebody comes in. Uh, I do about 75 tasks a day and I send at least that many emails a day. Uh, we're incredibly busy. I am happy to look at portfolios if I think it's useful for myself and the artist's time, uh, but certainly only with an appointment. And if you come in without an appointment, it's going to leave a bad taste in my mouth and it's just not a good introduction for you um, because it just doesn't make a great first impression. So always make an appointment. Um, so I'll scroll through this uh, um, a bit quickly to just kind of this, again, this is a, a bit of a, a presentation I've given for um, La Luz workshops with uh, Mary Virginia Swanson and other uh, workshops across the US on um, specifically on, as I was saying, the best methods and do's and don'ts of trying to approach a gallery with your work, uh, a commercial space. Um, and uh, I'll kind of go through it a bit quickly. I already gave you a little bit of the background of, of my gallery, as I mentioned. I've been in LA for about 12 years. I worked mostly for Peter Fetterman. Uh, this is a little show off slideshow of all the cool photographers I've worked with in the past. Now it's really a way to say like, oh, this guy looks like he's 20 years old, but he, he's rubbed shoulders with some of the heavy hitters. So he might know what he's talking about. Uh, of course, Jerry Olsman, God rest his soul, uh, who we recently lost. Um, Sebastian Salgado, uh, Pinti Samalati, and then some of the other artists that I work with currently, such as Albaron Cabrera, who are the prints you have there um, in, in your space that you can look at. And some of the recent events I've had at the gallery uh, when we launched such as the first exhibition here, which was artist Scott B. Davis with Getty Photographs, uh, I'm sorry, Getty Museum Curator of Photographs, Virginia Hecker. Um, I love my disclaimer. There are no rules to any of this. And in the end of the day, you need to make your own art. Uh, you need to look at a lot of art, but the only way to stand out in a world with a billion photographs a day is to make exactly only what you can make and no one else can do. So really lean into your most uh, weird thoughts and desires in, in terms of your artwork. Um, but that working with galleries is about making friends and um, relationships. The art business is not a normal business environment. It is something that really doesn't make sense. Snake oil or smoke and mirrors or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it, because of that, it's a place that's really based on relationships. And so it's meeting galleries, meeting curators, developing a relationship over time, letting them get to know your work. Most museums have their shows planned two to four years in advance. Uh, most galleries have their exhibition schedules planned a year in advance. So even if you do strike up a nice conversation, don't expect to have a show you know, next month. You might have a show in two years. Uh, and that's just the reality of, of uh, most galleries being working on a very small team. Um, and these are some of the points I've mentioned earlier. Of, and I will give you guys a link uh, to this. Carol, don't let me forget that to this page so you can look at it later. That's why I'm gonna go through it kind of quickly. Um, but being patient, being humble, sending a brief email, this is me, this is my work, this is why I think it might fit into your gallery. For your portfolios and website that you wanna share with galleries, edit, 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 keep it to your best, your grand slam greatest hits. You know, you wanna come out with the strongest foot, don't send me a PDF with 175 photographs, send me one with 12. I will know in 12 photographs of what you think is your best work, whether or not we're on the same page. Uh, so really uh, show it to a lot of other people, show it to your friends, show it to any gallerists, you know, curators, writers, um, and get feedback and, and try and consolidate as if you were editing the book down to the strongest, strongest work. Uh, this is in regards to any PDF that you make or website that you might edit. Knowing your audience, um, this is something that Mary Virginia Swanson, who I can talk about in a bit, uh, talks a lot about, uh, you know, the type of work that you're showing. Is it work that is more for um, a gallery? Is it work that is more for editorial magazine type of presentation? Is it documentary journalism? Um, if you are doing really powerful photographs of, uh, let's say, war photography, uh, it's really difficult to show that in a commercial gallery because Again, a commercial gallery has to sell prints and most people are not putting prints of um, conflict on their walls. Sometimes, yes, 
uh, but typically um, you want to know what what is the audience for this work? Is it is it um, people who are collecting photography or putting it into their homes? Is it stuff that is telling a documentary story and thus might live better in a magazine? Um, art fairs and festivals, uh, really important and hugely influential events in the world of fine art photography. There's a big and important difference between art fairs and let's say festivals of photography, such as the Paris Photo Art Fair in Paris coming up in a few weeks or the APAD Photography Show in New York in the spring. Those are commercial events uh, that are incredibly expensive for the galleries to be a part of and they are there to sell and to try to make money. They are not there to look at your portfolio. And if you go to an art fair and you ask if you can show a portfolio, you will never show with that gallery. And that will be the last discussion you have because they are extremely stressed and um, they don't wanna look at work, they want to sell work. Now festivals such as PhotoFest in Houston, um, I, I, there are a lot of them um, and you, you can find more of them online, but there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of festivals and workshops which are portfolio review events and those are the places where you do go to show work and to get feedback on your work but art fairs are still really important to attend as an artist because they are a place to uh, essentially research and take notes to see what kind of work is being shown uh, to see the price points to see the way people are presenting work how things are being framed how things are being labeled and, and discussed about uh, the type of prints so it's just a good way to uh, get get a finger on the pulse of the contemporary market for fine art photographs. Um, so there, these occur all over the world in the U.S. The prominent ones being uh, APAD in New York in the springtime, Paris Photo in um, November in Paris, which you see here on the right, which is about one fourth of the size of the show. It is a massive event. Um, you have uh, Photo London in London in the springtime as well. Uh, we have Photo LA here in Los Angeles in March, um, but there are smaller ones throughout throughout the country. And you can go to non-photo fairs, uh, which certainly happen in, in your region uh, to just kind of get a vibe for those. Uh, but it's a good way place to go. And, and if nothing else, you leave generally, I have always left as an artist side of my brain, really inspired to make work and excited to go to go make work because you just see so much and so much positive energy about the art world. It's a good place also to gather a lot of business cards. If you go around and you see a gallery that's like, oh, this this seems like I could I could put my work in, I could see my work on, you know, sharing the walls with these artists. Um, engaging online. Sorry, just getting over COVID recently. So still running out of oxygen every once in a while, everyone gets their turn. Um, so engaging online, I think most of you are already very well aware of the significance and, and the power of a, a prominent, um, a well-designed website, a, uh, a at least semi-active um, social media presence as much for a lot of us, social media is torture, um, but it is, more and more uh, helpful to at least be somewhat of a mobile portfolio if nothing else. I don't think you have to be posting every day. I don't think you need to put pictures of your, of your cat, um, but at least having, again, some of your best work on there is a great way. Um, as I said, a simple, reliable portfolio, a little goes a long way to just have your best work easily viewable. Um, and it's also a good way, as I said, to build relationships, to start to follow the galleries that you might be interested in and to start to comment on their posts, to message them occasionally, not stalk them, but message them. Um, making prints, uh, as much as I've elaborated on sending uh, a website, a PDF, an Instagram, um, you know, as an exhibitor, I, I need to see the object. And that's where photo festivals are really good because that's a place where you take physical prints and you're sitting across the table from curators, um, art directors, publishers, um, gallerists, and showing the physical thing and saying, you know, I, as a gallerist, if I'm going to see the work, yes, the first foot in the door is seeing it online generally, 
but that's only half the story. I then need to see what am I actually going to put on the wall? Um, so making prints, spending time uh, working with a printmaker, if, if you don't make the prints yourself that you trust, doing a lot of trial and error and trying to find either something that you're really proud of as a, as a beautiful object or experimenting. More and more, the contemporary galleries want to see um, something new from printmaking, such as the artist's print that you're seeing there and the one behind me, which are printed on a translucent Japanese tissue paper and mounted on gold leaf, which if you see them in person, you will notice gives them a really um, unique aesthetic quality. Um, but being patient and really focusing on the quality of your prints above all else, because that's what I'm going to exhibit. And as I had written here, you can't sell pixels in a gallery. As you see, I have struck that out because that has changed in recent history. I think you know what I'm talking about, and I'll get back to that in a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, pricing and additions. I could do an hour and a half lecture on this alone. This is the most complicated part and the biggest question. And unfortunately, something, again, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Um, I asked Carol in our email exchange, is it okay if I mention to them that I do private consulting if somebody's interested? Um, so because pricing in addition is a very personal one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, because it's very specific to where you are as an artist, uh, your the, the capabilities of printmaking, the size, the scale, the additions, there's a lot of variables. Um, but as you, most of you know, most contemporary photographers make their work in additions. I show a lot of artists who, um, who, who make unique pieces, so one of one, and that's because um, they have applied paint to the uh, photograph or they have uh, dipped the photograph in concrete or something crazy that makes it a one of a kind object. And, and at that point, we're kind of getting beyond the traditional photography um, exhibition and we're really seeing it as, as almost sculptural objects. But for most of the time, uh, we have additions, as you know, can be anywhere from three prints to 300. But more recently in, in the contemporary art world, we see pretty small additions, additions of uh, five, 10, 20. And we see a lot of what we call um, tiered pricing. That is being say, if we have an addition of 20, we might see additions of one through 10 priced at 1500, prints 11 through 15, 2000 and so forth. Um, basically, the the fewer prints remaining in addition, the higher the price. Um, so, and then there's artist proofs, which are usually reserved copies for the artist's private collection or for future museum shows. Uh, and then there are the details of how things are split with gallery sales. The traditional model is pretty basic. It's 50-50. If I sell your print for $1,000, you take 500, I take 500. Uh, that is changing a little bit depending on the artist and the, say if an artist has really high production costs because of how they make their work. Um, so there's some variation to that, but that's pretty standard. Um, and most galleries won't even have a conversation unless you're open to agree to that. Um, so that's just um, for you to know. And again, I can elaborate on any of this privately to someone's specific work. Douglas, uh, one I, thing I, yep. Can we ask a question about additions? So yep. I've read, um, I've read online in some sources that because um, editing, because our editing skills change, uh, you know, the software changes that some people talk about, uh, you know, the first edition and then the second edition being a re-edit, perhaps. Is that anything that mm, you would endorse, like looking at it that way? Or had, do you have thoughts about that? Uh, if, if, I, if I think I get what, what you're referring to, um, they're, they're, at least from a uh, market perspective, especially in vintage images that are edition, let's say an Irving Penn mm -hmm. fashion photograph, Generally, yes, the, the edition one will be the most valuable. Say if it were to go at auction, it would mm -hmm. probably do better than edition 10 of 25. Uh, because especially in analog printmaking and uh, platinum, silver gelatin, photogravures, you know, when the artist says, um, okay, this is it, that's number one. You know, it's, it's a statement 
in theory in the market theory that it's a statement of the artist to say this is the perfect one make make 24 more of these Mm -hmm. and so it gives it a bit of provenance and and, um weight to that individual piece because it's implied that the artist said this one is perfect this is the this is sort of the master print Um, so i think there's some credit to that in again in like vintage works i I had a case of that with an irving pen when i was at um, fetterman where the client asked us to search for years for number one and a lot of people do they get excited when they're getting number one even in a contemporary i think if it's a you know an inkjet print on you know hanamula paper from an epson printer and all 25 look exactly the same I don't, I don't really see, I mean, it's nice to have number one. It kind of looks nice, but I don't, and and maybe in the future it would have a little higher value, but Mm -hmm. I I see less, I see less um, gravitas when it's a mechanical digital process for that than an analog. I don't know if that's exactly answering your question, but. Yeah, um, I didn't, I didn't ask it the right way. Like, so when an artist, all right, prints 10 and mm -hmm. then re-edits edits again, to, you know, based on new found uh, skills or new, just a new perspective on the work. And then, so then mm. there's an, another set of 10, but it's a re-edit. Like, yeah. Okay. Even, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think you, you have to be careful with that because if it's, if it's too similar, especially if you're at first edition, just like sold out really quick. Yeah. And then you make another one. It's just slightly different. It happens a lot, especially for one hit wonder photographers from, you know, Mm -hmm. from bygone days. Um, And they have one image that sells really well and is in the history books. Um, And so they make an edition of 25 silver gelatin prints and that sells out. So then they make an edition of 25 platinum prints. Then they make an edition of 100 pigment prints. It it depends. You you risk flooding your market if if and if you have mm-hmm. collectors who are sensitive to that, they might abandon collecting your work because they feel like you're just going to keep making more prints. So what's the point of a limited edition? Um, so I think you want to be pretty set on your piece when you say, okay, we're done. This isn't. I'm done with this piece. Let's make the edition. Um, you know, if you if you make 10 16 by 20s and you get to number five and you're like i want to shift that one color just a little bit i think that's fine as long as you consider you continue as now number six of ten so as long as you don't change the the total number of prints that are in existence of that image Mm -hmm. now if it's substantially different you know if you've really you know if it's a warhol where it's totally different colors than the other one you know, then, then sure you can make a new edition, but you know, you got to be aware that collectors are going to, they're going to be aware of that and they're going to wonder how many of these you might do. And so, um, yeah, you just got to kind of case by case, I suppose, but I don't think there's a problem to make subtle changes as long as you, as long as you don't change the, um, maximum amount of copies that are out there. Great. Um, and, and you can also, you know, I've, I've had artists who originally it was going to be an edition of 20 and in the first few years they sold five and then it's kind of gone quiet and they're like you know what i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna change it to 10 instead of 20 and and you know and and might and then have a different marketing strategy or something so you can always make future editions you just got to be weary of potentially um frustrating any previous buyers Mm-hmm. who felt that they were promised there was only going to be 10 and now you're making 50. Yeah. Um, and then they probably won't buy your work again after that. So it's being uh, honest with your collectors, but these discussions uh, are usually something that you want to have with um, your gallerist. If you are working with a gallery on these sales or with, or with the collector themselves, if you're um, close with your collectors, then, then that's a conversation you can have with them as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as I said, you can't sell pixels in the gallery. That used to be the case, but apparently you can now. 
Um, I'm not an expert in this area of NFTs, uh, nor am I someone who really has any interest in it. Um, but it's something I try to stay uh, abreast of and educated on to a certain extent. Um, my only notes on it are to, um, to proceed with caution if you're going into that space and you're investing any money into that space uh, because it's the wild west. No one, there's really no rules. Uh, the market is quite down, I believe, at the moment for this space. Um, there was a lot of promise of get rich quick within the NFT world. And for some people, that was the case. I think for the vast majority of artists, uh, it was uh, not get anything or, if anything, maybe lose money on the time that they and the money that they invested into uh, because there's a cost to producing NFTs. Um, so, and, and one thing I think to be active in the NFT space, um, and I'm sorry for anyone in the room who's like, what is he talking about? I don't even know what an NFT is. Uh, I will, uh, it's too, too long to go into, but for those of you who are aware of it, um, from what I understand, it's to, to be involved in that space and to really have success in that space, you have to be constantly on social media, which is something I prefer not to do in my life, but um, if you live on Twitter and other social media apps, you can probably find some success there. If you don't, it will be very difficult. Um, but there's a great conversation with photographer Ruben Wu um, and PhotoEye, which you can watch on Vimeo. It's about a 30 minute conversation on fine art photography and the NFT space, uh, which I found very unpretentious and very objective and interesting if you are curious. Uh, and Ruben Wu is one of those cases of someone who has had a uh, pretty substantial financial success in that space. And I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, professionalism and all of this is key. Working with galleries, uh, um, delivering work professionally packed, uh, delivering prints professionally made. If you're doing the framing, investing time and money into the quality. Um, professionalism is everything in uh, establishing a long-term working relationship with galleries. If you send me a folder of JPEGs, please don't send me a folder that is DSC underscore 87212.jpg, you know, times infinity. Send me, you know, um, Western sunset to 2017.jpg. Make it easy for me to look at your work and to understand the work. Um, and to be organized and to be able to deliver files quickly uh, and be responsive to emails. Uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, I'll leave the, the rest of this for another time. I, again, I'll drop the link to this. If you want to scroll through it, there's some interesting links and videos at the bottom and my contact information um, on Instagram and my email. As I mentioned, I do do more extensive private cons consults on these topics that are specific to your work and sort of function as an extended portfolio review. Um, so you can reach out to me if that's something you might be interested in. Um, so yeah, that's about all I got. That's usually more of like an hour long thing, but again, keep it brief and um, happy to answer any questions. I have a question, I'm gonna start. I have a question about how you put together a show. Do you see work first and then ponder it and then identify a theme or imagine artists together? Um, or do you have start with the theme and then go search? Do you do it both ways? Yeah, both ways. Um, I do, you know, I do solo exhibitions. Um, two and three artist exhibitions, which tend to be more of a thematic dialogue or a material dialogue, um, or in this case, currently a, a larger thematic group exhibition. So, you know, for the solo show, that's usually, you know, I've seen somebody who I just think their work is spectacular. I meet them, we have a good energy. We seem to be on the same wavelength um, of our tastes and, and what we want to accomplish with an exhibition of that artist's work. And then from there, it's really a team effort. And that's where I think the 50-50 sales split comes from uh, is because once we make an exhibition, it's really both of us in on it 100%. Um, 
Um, so that's usually starting just with the work. And, and then, you know, it's a question, is it a new body of work? Is it a summary of this artist's work to date? Um, is it something experimental for this artist? Um, but that usually starts with the work. Um, the two and three artist show is usually, um, I think there would be an interesting dialogue between these two artists because they're doing similar things, but coming to really different ends with similar means or something like that. Um, and I think it would just be an interesting dialogue between them. And then the larger group shows, which can be anywhere from you know five to in this case, um, actually 18 artists in this current show. Um, you know, this was one where we started with a theme, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of the singular figure in the frame and, and how far the subject uh, moves. So all the pieces in the current exhibition have one figure in, in the frame, uh, can be up close, can be really, really far. Uh, and this idea really came from um, the photographs by Harry Callahan of his wife, Eleanor. Um, one of the great American black and white photographers of the 20th century. And he had all these really amazing portraits where Eleanor um, was a, a, a tiny little figure. Um, I can actually pull it up real quick. Um, a tiny figure off on the horizon. And I always kind of um, thought they're really powerful because um, despite the um, distance uh, to the subject, you still could tell, I'm just gonna share real quick. You could still tell that it is an intimate portrait of Eleanor. Um, in this case, Eleanor on uh, along one of the Great Lakes in Chicago. Somebody fill me in, is that Erie or Michigan or not sure? Michigan. Um, okay. Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, but there's a lot of these portraits uh, by Harry of Eleanor where you can tell it's a picture about her and she's the, she's the sort of star, but she's not, it's not what you would necessarily call a traditional portrait. You know, it's not the three quarter torso uh, portrait, which he has many of as well. And some of them she's even further, she's, she's down the street, but she's positioned in a way that compositionally you go straight to her. And I was really inspired by those uh, photographs and so um, started selecting a lot of these others. These are some of the vintage pieces that are in the gallery's library. Uh, we have several Lee Friedlanders, Frederick Summer, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, George Tice. Uh, again, where the singular figure might be at distance, uh, but still a, a prominent um, focus of the composition. Um, these are some of the other pieces that are in that that exhibition. So in this case, yes, it started with a theme. Let's make a show about um, the portraiture slash landscape and having singular figures in the frame. But then we started to go off a little bit and we we're like, okay, maybe they don't have to be the full figure. Maybe it's just a limb mm. in the frame. Um, maybe it's just a reflection. Um, this is kind of one of my favorites in the show by Rania Matar. Uh, in Beirut, looking out at the silos that exploded in 2020. So yeah, it can be it can be both. It can be thematic, and we kind of then start finding pieces. But even then, it's usually inspired by a couple pieces. You know, this show definitely was like started to see a few. But there's some like I'm working on a show of uh, Polaroid, uh, of instant film Polaroids, mm. and sometimes you know I have a handful of artists that I already know are going to be in the show but I want to find a few more and I can literally go on artsy and just search medium Polaroid and see, see if something comes up that I feel like I could get access to. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I do have other questions, but I want to pause and not dominate the questions. Um, anybody online have a question for Douglas? Okay. How about in the room? Yeah, my question would be if two or maybe four photographers thought they might have a good group show already, would you entertain that thought? Or do you rather get to know the artists, you know, separately and then decide if you would put together a show as a group, sh group show? Um, yeah, no, that, that happens. Actually, I did a show in, um, great question. I did a show in March um, called The Composition of Possibilities. And in that case, it was a, a curator 
who had already curated this show of um, three artists from Mexico City. And they had shown it last uh, November at PhotoFest, and uh, I'm sorry, not at PhotoFest, at the Houston Center of Photography. Um, and they reached, and one of the artists in the show is an artist that I already work with. So the curator reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we've got this show. It's already in the US, it's already framed, it's packed, it's ready to go on the walls. It's about enough work to fill your space. Um, are you interested? And, and fortunately, uh, as I said, I already worked with one of the artists, so that was big foot in the door. Uh, and the other two artists, I really liked their work as well. And, and the type of work really um, fit my aesthetic of a lot of the other work that I show. So it was kind of a no brainer. I didn't have to pay for anything. I didn't have to pay for any framing, any shipping. Uh, I didn't have to select the works, you know, that all I had to do was kind of lay it out in my space. So yes, uh, that can be an advantage to presenting uh, to a show. But as I mentioned, even with an artist themselves contacting a gallery, if it was a group of artists, uh, you want to make sure that you know you're being honest that you really think that that show seems like it would fit in that gallery. Like looking at their previous exhibitions, looking at their the size of their space, looking at the type of work that they represent on their artist roster, that it seems um, like it would fit. And that's in the context of a commercial gallery that is run by one or a couple directors and curators. Um, when it comes to a, a nonprofit space or like a regional museum, um, which are, I'm sure you guys have, and, and there are many around the US, um, that's more of a proposal, a kind of formal proposal system of like, hey, we have this idea for a show. And they're going to be less um, uh, critical on you know the aesthetics of the work if it's you know if it's a good show they'll they'll be open to it because it's not being presented in comparison to the previous exhibitions or future exhibitions like it is in my gallery or commercial gallery they're kind of because you know most of the artists that i show their work stays here um, the artists that i represent um so i guess what i'm saying is a place like uh, the center for photographic art in carmel a small regional nonprofit exhibition space. Um, you know, they do a show, they show the work, and then all that show goes back to the artist or artists. Um, and then the next show comes in, and then that show goes back. They don't, they don't store, they don't represent artists long term, and so they don't have sort of an aesthetic brand that they have to maintain as as a gallery does. Um, so, shortened, yes, that that's a perfectly fine proposal to reach out to exhibition spaces of any kind and say, you know, if and, and you can reach out to anybody, but in terms of trying not to waste your own time, uh, you know, research the spaces and, and see if it seems like the type of space that would be accepting of that proposal. Great. Right. Thank you. Any other questions here? Okay, go ahead. Tara. Okay, two quick questions. One is um, one is going to be about the gallery, and one is going to be about um, one of these pieces that I have with me. And so, uh, walking into various gallery spaces, you see different um, wall colors. So you know, often a neutral gray. You know, sometimes it's warm or cool. And I notice in your space, I'm noticing the light color up front and the really dark color in back. So I'm wondering how often you choose a wall color um, intentionally around a new show that's coming in. I'm uh, me personally, I'm a pretty subtle, quiet person. Most of my wardrobe is gray, black, greens, browns. I'm not a very loud uh, person and my gallery reflects that. Uh, as you mentioned, the gallery walls here are uh, a, a sort of um, warm gray uh, and the back room is uh, was Sherwin-Williams iron ore. I'm very, I always say I'm so jealous of the person who professionally names paint colors. I think that must be a fun, <laughs> fun job because uh, you know somebody does that. Some, mm. That's someone's job. Uh, so anyways, the back gallery for this exhibition is, is dark gray, almost black. Uh, and that's because uh, I noticed that we had a small group of uh, photographs that were kind of nocturnal images. Uh, and so I thought that would be nice to have those isolated into this um, uh, back room and just to have a different 
sort of a different energy. I also occasionally do video projections in there. So that works for that as well. Uh, I did a show last year where we had a, it was a cyanotype show and we had one wall that was just like bright, bright blue. Um, and that, that, that was nice, but I would love to do more of that, but I'm, I'm usually not confident enough in my decisions to go with like a neon yellow or something. Um, so I don't change it too often because I, you know, I want to, I wanted always wanted my gallery to feel as you might see, I have a bonsai here behind me. There's a few other plants, there's nice furniture. I always wanted my gallery to be something that was warm and relaxing and unpretentious. Uh, not just the white cube experience of stark white walls and bright fluorescent lights and no furniture, just concrete and white sort of purgatory galleries. Um, so that's a little just my different approach. Uh, I think that was inspired maybe by Frankel Gallery in San Francisco, uh, who has really beautiful wood floors and dark gray walls. And I just always, uh, if you go to museums, most museums usually have, you know, subdued lighting, Mm -hmm. um, darker walls um, and just creates a more relaxing environment than like the going into a gallery like oh my god it's so bright right um yeah so i don't change my own walls too often and don't intend to for a while um but i do know kind of like to the, the paint color person uh, there's a gentleman here in los angeles called it's called named scott flex who is a professional color consultant for museums and galleries Oh. So when the Getty, the Getty is making a big exhibition of Imogen Cunningham photographs, he comes in, he sees the installation and they will pick paint colors um, and advise on that. And he has a whole method of how he does that. Wow. Um, where the rest of us go to Home Depot and look at the million swatches and get <laughs> overwhelmed. And I just pick a random gray because I like the name of it. Great. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this very well on the screen. Yeah, I think, well, there's, it's not. Oh, well, it looks great. I know, I know it very well though. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, everyone else there, um, it's this a very interesting piece. And um, this is the artist, the artist, Alberon Cabrera that um, Douglas mentioned earlier um, in this just framed uh Printed on the Gampy paper and um, uh, mounted on gold leaf. So, um, Douglas, I remember you talking about this with me and it kind of the, the concept that they were, um, the concept of some of their work, it, uh, commenting on time. Mm. It, do you remember? Do you remember what you were saying to me? And can you uh, sort of repeat that or? Kind of yeah 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 that's 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 what i do all day long so i can uh, and i can share it on my screen so you can uh, not not uh, not hurt your arms uh let's see here so um yeah this is a piece by um alberon cabrera as you saw it's a pretty small format it's um, about seven by ten inches uh alberon cabrera spanish duo based in barcelona it's uh, anna cabrera and her husband angel alberon um they're some of the most exciting photographers that i've come across in recent history and they make these beautiful little gym objects as you see there um and this piece uh is from their series kairos and which is um uh, a greek word um, and it's a body of work that they wanted to make thinking about time and how the um, what we call the present moment is sort of an imaginary space between uh, a remembered past and a imagined future. Um, this work was heavily inspired by the um, um, physicist Carlo Rovelli in his book, The Order of Time, which if you were interested in trying to understand how we comprehend time and how time actually works in physics, and you want to be incredibly confused um, <laughs> and give it about three attempts at reading, which I did and finally understood a little bit. Um, but basically that the present moment is um, being something between past and future is, is an imaginary idea that we have conceived as humans. Um, and to represent that and 
photographs, as most of their work is about representing philosophical ideas in photography. Um, they did this body of work where they combined two photographs of the same location a few moments apart, uh, then printing a sliver of those two um, and combining them on one final piece, uh, as you see here, and then um, physically removing a little sliver between those two. And what you see between is the gold leaf that is behind the surface paper, which is coming through and illuminating the, the top and bottom a little bit, but you're actually seeing it here in the middle, which they just literally use like an exacto knife to kind of gently remove a little thin layer. And that layer is to uh, represent this imaginary uh, present moment between the past and future. Um, so you see that in, in several works from the Kairos series. Um, sometimes it's physical, uh, as, as I was saying, as it's cut out um, between the two. Um, sometimes, as you see again here, of the uh, Buddha on this same scene with two moments apart uh, and the present moment being represented by this thin sort of um, gold line. And then sometimes being represented as just a void. Uh, this is the first print that I ever saw by them. Uh, I was walking through Photo London in 2017 and came across this and was just mesmerized by it. It's essentially just two photographs uh, of you know a forest and sky, one inverted and blending the two skies together and having this ethereal space, uh, this imaginary void between a past and future. Um, and that just really struck a note with me as I think it did with Carol. And, um, you know, I, again, I want to see photographs that are not only beautiful aesthetically, but that have some uh, spiritual, philosophical, conceptual subtext to them that makes them more than just a pretty picture. Uh, ideally, it's both of those combined. So, yeah. And you can see, you know, this is the artist, so you can see uh, more of their work on my on my website. You can see a video of them talking about their work and these ideas, which is really uh, impactful. And I think Carol would recommend. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For sure. <clears throat> yep. All right. Anyone? Anyone online? Any anything come to your mind? Anyone else in the room? Okay. Uh, Douglas, I can't thank you enough for your time and um, insights, <laughs> no worries. really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I put in the chat, uh, maybe you can extract it and find out how to best get it to everyone. Uh, oh, the okay. link the link to that best practices uh, web page, which is hidden, uh, and the uh, password, which, oh, which I'm, I messed up. The password is actually 2022, not 2020. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, and then my website and the general contact if anybody wants to reach out. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody, uh, um, I've sent your website out so people okay. um, have, but um, thank you. And um, just um, sent you a message. Fabulous. All right, cool. everyone. Thanks, Douglas. All right. Talk to I'll, you. I'll jump out. You guys take care. And um, yeah, we'll talk to you again soon. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, I'm just going to pull that document. This page is protected. 2022. 2022. And we'll um, uh, uh, save this password. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you. We... Where is that? Resume recording. Oh, there it is. There it is.